The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory be to thee, O Lord. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. By the words of the Gospel, may our sins be blotted out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, happy Valentine's Day to all of you. I hope your hearts are warm, and I hope the rest of you will be staying warm in the cold days ahead. I've always thought that St. Valentine would be a lovely name for a parish church. It just seems to fit so well for inviting people to church. You already know the name. You're already bought in. Sounds like a lovely place to be. If God blesses us with swelling numbers, we can plant a church named for him. The next time February 14th falls on a Sunday will be in 2027. Wouldn't it be something to have a church plant named for him on that occasion? So that's six years from now, so let's get to work. Surprisingly, given the English custom of exchanging Valentines on this day, we know of no church dedicated to him in all of Britain. I only found three Catholic parishes named for him in the United States. And there seems to be no Anglican parishes dedicated to him anywhere. Perhaps just as surprisingly, although there is an Episcopal church in Valentine, Nebraska, it's named for St. John. Now, there are three martyrs named Valentine, and they're all just piled in one commemoration on this day. The first and the foremost is a priest in Rome in the third century who assisted St. Marius and his family and other holy martyrs in the persecution under the Emperor Claudius II, the Goth. Now, at that time, the army would turn away young men who got married, and so that was another reason young men were looking to get married. Valentine would perform weddings for these couples if they were serious about making a family, not just running away from responsibility. By the way, if you're going to run away from responsibility by running into a marriage, you're running the wrong direction. We taught them how to find true love, and it's not found in your heart. True love comes from above and not just because it rhymes. The civic authorities, of course, they didn't like Valentine stealing away soldiers. And as a priest, he also gathered special attention from the authorities since to make one of the clergy deny the faith would be a tremendous prize. Valentine was discussing the faith with Judge Asterius while under house arrest. Asterius decided to test the power of this Jesus that he kept talking about, and he brought his adopted blind daughter to visit with Valentine. The saint laid his hands on the child's eyes, and her vision was restored. As a result, all of the idols around the judge's home were smashed and broken. The Christian inmates under his authority were all set free, and the judge his family, and his 44-member household were all baptized. 
Valentine was a very likable fellow, but kind of a troublemaker for the empire. He was later arrested again for continuing to proselytize, and he was sent to the prefect of Rome, and even to the emperor Claudius himself. But he steadfastly refused to deny Christ. Claudius took a liking to him until Valentine, up to his old tricks again, tried to convince Claudius to embrace Christianity. The emperor ordered that Valentine be beaten with clubs. Remaining faithful to the end, Valentine was at last banished and beheaded as a witness to Christ on February 14th, about the year 269 or 270. The martyr was buried on the Flemian Way on the north side of Rome. About the year 350, Pope Julius I had a church built over his tomb. This shrine was one of the first things that the eyes of pilgrims saw when they approached the great holy city of Rome. And so devotion to Valentine spread far and wide when these pilgrims went home. In the ninth century, Valentine's relics were transferred to the Basilica of St. Praxedes, just outside the old city walls. Later, his relics made their way to several churches all around Europe. Most famously, his skull is kept at the Roman Basilica of St. Mary in Cosmedine. You might have seen pictures on Facebook in memes about Valentine's Day. Another Valentine was martyred around the same time as the first. This Valentine was a bishop of Iteramnia in central Italy, now called Terni. He was buried somewhere near the capital city, but the location was lost and his memory and veneration were basically conflated with the first Valentine. And all that we know really of the third Valentine is that he died in Africa with some companions. The origin of the custom of exchanging Valentine's cards on this feast day remains obscure. We do know that in England it was believed of old, as noted in Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls, that the birds began to choose their mates about this day, and therefore it became a time to arrange betrothals, or at least to try to. By the way, my neighborhood has been swarming with robins lately. They've been bobbing all over the place, hundreds of them. I guess they're fleeing south to escape the cold front. The name Valen Valentine comes from the word valens, which means strong or worthy. He showed great strength and worthiness in his fidelity to Christ, facing torture and execution, and his faithful ministry to Christian people remained valiant in times of persecution. And he was ever sharing his faith with others, looking for opportunities to turn conversations toward things that matter in the end, like divine love. John the Apostle was a witness to the love of God. Along with Peter and James, he was there, as we heard in the Gospel today, when that incarnate love was manifested on the mountain, radiating with divine glory. And along with the Blessed Mother and the other women, he was there at the cross as Jesus bled and suffered and died. In what John's Gospel calls the hour of his glory. John was a witness to the shining glory of the mountaintop and the hidden glory of the salvation won at the cross. And what did he take away from these experiences? His insight was that the most descriptive word that we have about God in the end is the word agape, unconditional love. He wrote in his first epistle, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. What is love, really? Philosophers and poets have wrestled with that question for centuries. Perhaps few people handled it better than did Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, that great ode to love in his chapter, 
Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We often tend to think of love as an emotion because we feel it so deeply. But true love is not an emotion. Let me say that again. True love is not an emotion. Virtue resists emotional decision-making. Or to say it better, the true truth of love should not be evaluated on the basis of emotion, on how deeply or strongly it is felt. The virtue of love lies not in the emotions, but in the will. We have only, of course, limited control over the intensity of our feelings or what feelings we have. But we can control our wills. We may have feelings, but it's up to us to decide what to do with that. And this is where virtue comes into play. That's where we find love. Nevertheless, deeply felt love is a precious gift that God does give to some. And he does not reward it according to our merit. He gives it out, as with all his gifts, graciously, as he so desires. Deeply felt love is a gift to be prayed for, to be asked for. It certainly makes virtue and the practice of religion much easier and the reward of it much sweeter and much more joyful. But let us make no mistake, love is not in the feeling, but in the doing. In his book on Anglican Moral Theology, Bishop Mortimer explains, quote, what is required of us here in this life is that by a constant act of the will, we put God first, that we value him above everything else. That's the theological virtue of love, the habit of putting God first. St. Francis de Sal said, true virtue has no limits, but goes on and on, and especially holy charity which is the virtue of virtues, and which having a definite object would become infinite if it could meet with a heart capable of infinity. That's why God first gives us his own love, so that we could love him in return. No one knew that better than Jesus' beloved disciple, John. Remember, he knew God was love because he was the apostle at the cross. It was not because he felt the feeling, but because he witnessed the doing. God is love, he would say. I know, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. The tears and the shed blood, the nails, the crown of thorns, the pierced side, the last breath. In 1 John 4, 9 through 11, the apostle wrote, In this the love of God was manifested among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to to love one another. The theological virtue of love is about directing our hearts and our wills to God in holy charity. But by its very nature, if that love is genuine, it cannot help but spill over into love toward others, especially toward the brethren, but also to those not of the body. We cannot help but love our neighbor if we really do love God, because a soul so infused with this virtue will find God in his neighbor. The face of the friend and the stranger will be the face of Christ. That's how you know if the love of God lives in your heart. It's not measured in the feeling, 
but in the doing. Valentine loved the Lord, and he loved his flock, even above his own life. He had the good habit, the virtue, of putting them first, putting God first, and he loved by doing. St. Valentine's Day is a day to search out for true love. In order to love someone else in the truest sense, we must first come to know the love of God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Church of Rome, God shows his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love can strengthen us to love others completely. Through Jesus, we can know the true love that comes down from above. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.